Wow, this is an attentive crowd. Can everybody hear me? So it's nine o'clock, and we're going to get this program started because we have a lot in store for you today. I'm Sue Minter. I'm the executive director of Capstone Community Action. I am thrilled that you are all here in the Barry Old Labor Hall, a community asset that was built in 1900. So we thank uh, the folks whose shoulders we uh, stand on. I also want to tell you I've been looking very forward to this for a number of reasons, not only because it's finally a chance to talk about uh, the needs of our communities, but it's my big first opportunity to publicly sport equal pay. Let's give it up for the Burlington High School girls soccer team and change the story who have been making her story right now, uniting people across this country. They've been in Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, on our sheroes like Abby Wambach, Megan Rapino. let's keep going. So I want to give a couple quick shout outs because I'm not here for long. First, events like this don't happen uh, by magic. They happen with talented, uh, skillful, committed people. Shout out to uh, Let Change the Stories. Allie Johnson Kurtz, please stand up. <laughs> Jess, Jessica Nordhaus. Capstone Community Actions, one and only Liz Scharf. Where are you, Liz? Okay, I also know there are a lot of distinguished public officials here, and I'm not going to take the time or be mistaken by missing somebody. So instead, I'm going to ask everyone who is an elected official, you can be a state representative, a city councilor, a mayor, or a select board member, or a planning commission. Everyone who's an elected official, please stand up and be recognized. Because we can scheme and dream, but we need, we know elections matter, and that's why we need great representation in all aspects of our governance. So, many of you may have never heard of Capstone Community Action, and I want to just tell you ever so quickly that we are an organization that was born out of the war on poverty in 1965. And we have been working ever since to help Vermonters rise out of poverty. We do that through an array of programs, but they're focused primarily on four key areas, making ends meet through heat, food, and housing, helping build strong families to break the generational cycle of poverty through Head Start and early learning, helping families keep their homes warm and healthy through our weatherization program, and opening doors of economic opportunity through our suite of financial empowerment programs and workforce programs that you're gonna hear more about today. That's what Capstone is all about. And why are we here? And we are so thrilled to be partnering with Change the Story, the Vermont Works for Women, the Women's Commission, the Women's Fund. Why here and why with Capstone? Well, sadly, you're going to learn a lot of data today that explains that reasoning. And it's because women make up a disproportionate share of people in poverty, a disproportionate share of people in low wage jobs, a disproportionate share of women, families with single headed households with children who are below the federal poverty later, uh, level. You're going to learn more about that. But when Tiff and I had breakfast this summer and we were sharing our excitement about our current missions, we started to think about the power of the data that she and Change the Story are bringing to all of us 
activists and policymakers alike. But we really want to explore today the stories behind the numbers. Because it is about more than numbers. It's about real people and their stories. It's about understanding the real life barriers that exist for so many women. And how are they managing to overcome those barriers to change their stories? So today we're gonna get a glimpse of some of the data. We're gonna meet up close some of the women in Capstone's programs. And I do wanna recognize that throughout this room, uh, our program participants are with you in the discovery. And I wanna thank each and every one of them for coming and being a part of this today. Because it's really about learning about the challenges and how people are overcoming them that are going to sow the seeds of the change that we are going to build. So let's get going. Right now, you're going to start by engaging with one another at your tables. This room is going to get loud and lovely. You have a facilitator at each of your tables, uh, and you have a, a conversation card. And uh, that's all you need, that and some skills at listening and at sharing. Um, we are going to ask for volunteers in about, we have about 20 minutes, we're still on time, to do that. And I'm going to then uh, call some of you to share some important learning uh, that you've made. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much for being here. Let's get started. Clap like me, ready? Excellent. Okay, and now I hope you've had some meaningful conversations at your tables. Uh, we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear what resonated with you. What ideas, what uh, was thought provoking? We're kinda just gonna popcorn it up. We understand that you all have someone chosen amongst you to say something. So when, and when you are inspired, and we want many of you to be inspired, please stand up. We have Liz is going to have a mic to share your insights. Who wants to go first? Let's see it. Come on, who's the winning table? Oh, OK, here we go. Please introduce yourself uh, and your story. Thank you. And you only have about one minute, because we have about 18 tables in 10 minutes. Hi, my name is Lori Flaherty, and I work for Northern Reliability. Um, we had a lot of good conversation here, but the big points that um, you know kind of resonated with all of us were how early finance discrimination starts in the programming from society, um, and how different the programming is for females versus males, um, and even like talking about children's books and how much there's you know oppressive gender bias. Um, and we want to know, like, how do we change this cycle? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we start early changing this cycle? And we also had a really good conversation about childcare and supporting working mothers, um, and especially the challenges for single parents. Thank you. Fundamental questions that I think we're going to learn more of what's behind those issues. Who's next, please? That was perfect, Lori Flaherty. Thank you. And she is from Waterbury, my town, so I will acknowledge that. <laughs> OK, I see one with a great T-shirt. And they make great holiday gifts, by the way. They do. They're excellent. Hi. I didn't know you were here, Scott. Hi. Um, I'm Stacey King from VSAC. That's my CEO over there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we had a great conversation um, here about various ways we all unintentionally reinforce bias all the time. So when I went into the preschool and saw that my daughter's teacher was a male, I was a little taken aback. It turned out he was amazing. Um, and an unnamed person at this table had the experience of a group of women reaching out to a legislature, legislator multiple times and then getting no response and finally signing an email as a male and getting a response in 20 <gasps> minutes. Mm. 
Okay. Still there. Subliminal, unconscious bias, such a problem that we confront on so many levels. Who wants to talk next? Thank you. You guys are doing a great job. I need to get my exercise. I need to stand up straight. <laughs> I'm Don Magnus. I'm with Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation. And just to kind of dovetail off of what was already being discussed, we ended up kind of going into the conversation of hidden poverty and how prevalent it is in every county in the state. And then that kind of went into the disparity between white women in poverty and women of color in poverty, which then went into the hidden racism in Vermont. And just kind of discussing like, how can we as white people, especially at our table, <laughs> we're all white, uh, address that and just the concepts of what people could say that uh, definitely is racist and might not be understood as racist, like um, commenting on seeing a non-white person walking on the street, celebrating that concept and wondering where someone is actually from. That's a really common one we talked about. And then just the idea of you know being a, what a real Vermonter is and people wanting real Vermonters and what that really means is actually white people and just mm. how to address that sort of thing because you can't talk about women without talking about, <clears throat> about people of color as well and the racism that's prevalent in our whole country, especially in the rural communities. Thank you. Such intensely important issues. And boy, will you learn more about uh, the kernels of those topics, racism and poverty, and all of those unconscious levels of bias that affect the way we think all the time. It's great that we're un, uh, in unveiling them and exploring them. Um, I see a hand here as well as over there for Liz. Here we go, right in front. And then we'll go to the far side, my right next. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. I'm Ellen Dorsch. Um, I'm not with any organization. I'm a freelancer, I guess. Pardon me? Yeah, I'll hold it. So we certainly second the conversation around age and how so much starts at such an early age. But my, one of my favorite parts of our conversation was um, we were looking at the Let's Talk card, and it says, how often are you aware of your gender? And we heard a number of situations in one of the women's lives, and then she said, but you know what? I'm really delighted when I don't even think about my gender. And I thought that was really telling. Thank you. Great point about, I was thinking before, about gender identity. Um, to the far side of the room, and I, while you're walking, I want to acknowledge how great it is that this room is filled with a lot of different perspective, uh, private sector, public sector, freelance sector, um, folks in the education and the economic development field, uh, obviously in the social service field. Thank you. It's so great to have this range of perspectives. Go ahead. Hi. I'm Laurie Stavron. I work for USCR Vermont. As I look around the room, I'm looking for people of color, women of color, men of color, and it's a very white room. Um, I think there are many reasons for that. One is what kind of jobs women of color are able to have. Usually um, they're lower wage, more restricted in the hours that they have to work. Um, probably most people in this room have more flexibility or responsibility to be here. And I think it's all of our responsibility to make sure that women of color have a voice and they have the opportunity to be in management and in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it's reminding me, I uh, serve on a board of directors, and we have uh, a, a national organization that has had a required, 100% of the board members across the country have to do training on diversity and inclusion, and it is extremely thought-provoking matter that I think we all need to engage, no matter where we are in our organizations, that we have to be very intentional about inclusion. Uh, where, who's next? I know there's people with interesting perspectives to share. I see someone in the middle, looks like a man. <laughs> Thank you to all of the men champions here with us. This is not my perspective. Um, I, I'm the facilitator of this table, so I'm just gonna 
uh, bubble out some of the, th the themes uh, that weren't already expressed earlier. Um, so uh, one uh, of interest talking about messaging that, we, that uh, you hear about your gender uh, that was said a, a, a few times around this table is the message that they heard, someone heard at home as a kid from their parents uh, was not necessarily the same message that they then received when they went to school uh, and the challenges that that created uh, for them. Um, but one very interesting uh, and um, uh, just very interesting observation that was pointed out is that, uh, especially in a room full of of champions who are passionate about, uh, um, I'm sure like, things like equity uh, and accessibility uh, and opportunity, is that uh, we're holding this gathering in a space that is not the most accommodating to someone with a disability, uh, and uh, so. Um, even with the, all the best intentions, uh, we can be blind to uh, the, uh, uh, the barriers that, uh, that others may face. So I thought that was really interesting. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to call on one last, maybe we have time for two quick uh, comments, and those will be the last two. Hi, I'm Lynn Vera. I'm speaking for some of the people at my table who brought up an interesting systemic problem among nonprofits and, and those of us here to help that unwittingly sometimes we put barriers in place to resources, one in particular child care subsidy. The application isn't particularly friendly to someone who has a stay-at-home, self-designed small business. In fact, she stopped the business rather than try to get childcare, she stayed home to take care of the kids because the subsidy was just too complicated to get without an ally and an advocate to fill it out. And another person um, who spoke about trying to get a grant to take a course to change careers as she was getting older and the fine print ended up tripping her up and costing her a lot of money when they nixed it at the last minute. So I think sometimes those of us really trying to help need to be asking the people, how can we make this better? Thank you for raising those incredibly important points that we learn a lot about with the folks who work with us to improve their lives, the multiple barriers that, that we often do not recognize without that perspective. Did you want to share, Mia, and that'll be the last one? Thanks. Hi, I'm Mia Moore. Um, I work for myself as a management and organizational development coach. And um, our conversation was fairly meandering and touched on many of the points that people brought up, but um, ended on, a, on an optimistic note, which um, feels good to share. So um, one of the people at our table um, talked about an example from her life of how she didn't see any women in the workforce represented in her family when she was young. And that struck me as um, how much progress we have made, and not in a way of like, oh great, it's so much better than it used to be, but more um, a recognition that um, that progress came from a lot of agitation and a lot of um, intentionality for people for their own lives and also um, communities and organizations like Change the Story um, really pushing these issues and um, it, may, it gives me a lot of optimism for just looking around and seeing the people in this room and the int intentionality that we have about this and um, the real agitation that we're having right now that we can make significant shifts in just one more generation um, that even beyond what we've seen so far. So um, awesome. I wanted to share Thank that. Thank you for sharing that and I will tell you I am a Title IX generation, and for many of you, you may not have known, but there was no women's soccer. I got a chance to play soccer in college. I coached soccer. I am so proud of these soccer girls moving forward for equal pay and equal rights, and let's keep agitating. All right, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing with one another your stories, uh, your hopes, your aspirations. Thank you for listening to one another. I think for many of the participants in our programs, the most powerful thing we offer is listening and helping them to understand and helping them to believe in themselves. So you have no idea the impact that you have. 
Um, I'm excited now. We're going to move to a little bit more uh, sharing from the stage. Um, and we're going to introduce the partners behind this production. Uh, and of course, the star of the show, uh, Tiff Bloomley, who will share uh, some of the data. And then we're going to also invite some of uh, Capstone program participants to share some of their success stories and learn from that. So I'd like to welcome Carrie Brown, the Executive Director of Vermont Commission on Women. And we're going to have you come on up together because it'll be faster that way. Ronnie Basden, the brand new Executive Director of uh, Vermont Works for Women. We're so happy that you're here in Vermont Great. with us. Welcome. <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are. Now you're getting it. And this is Meg Smith, the Director of the Vermont Women's Fund. Thank you all, and I'm going to give each of you a chance to share a brief bit about, oh, you've got the mic, perfect. Thank you, Sue. Uh, I'm Carrie Brown, the director of the Vermont Commission on Women. We are a state agency. We've been around since 1964, and we have never once had a moment where we weren't trying to close that dang wage gap. And hopefully, we'll be able to move on to some other things every once in a while in the future. Um, but one of the things that we have done a lot of in our work is research, provide data, and be a source of information. But never have we been able to have the depth and the breadth of the data that we have through our partnership with Change the Story. And I just can't even express how incredibly valuable and useful it is. And one of the things about this report in particular that I think you'll hear some about is some of the reasons why we have that wage gap. Uh, so I'm constantly trying to tell people that it's so much more complicated than it's usually portrayed as just simply a matter of equal pay for equal work and some really rotten people discriminate against women and don't pay them properly. That happens, but there's so much more to it. And this report goes into some of those reasons and backs it up with some of the data to illustrate that and to show what we're talking about. So I hope you enjoy reading that when you have some time. And um, thank you so much for coming. Very happy that you're here. Well, and thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm Ronnie. The brand new week in executive director of Vermont Works for Women. Um, but what I think I'm most excited and fortunate about in reading this report and kind of being shared with a preview last week is how fortunate as Vermonters we are to have this level of data and what we can actually do with it. As the programmatic arm of this partnership, it's exciting to be able to have a strategic direction about where we should be focusing, what we should be looking at, and also encouraging what we have been doing for the past 30 years, making sure that we're not only trying to change the statistics for women currently in in the workforce, but for that next generation of girls that are coming into this, where we really do need to be moving that needle forward. So I feel fortunate that we have this level of data. It's incredible to comb through. While some is not surprising, it continues to be incredibly disheartening that this is still where women are at in our community. So Vermont Works for Women will continue to serve the women and girls in our state and along with this data, really make sure that it's an informed and intentional programmatic arm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, and welcome. We're thrilled to have you. Hi, everybody. I'm Meg Smith. I'm director of the Vermont Women's Fund, and I'm so fired up to be here today. Uh, when we first got together, um, well, let me first start and tell you about the Women's Fund. It was started 25 years ago by a group of women who were frustrated that women and children were not getting the services and the needs uh, that they had to be met by you know, the public and private sector. And let's face it, money is power. And the Women's Fund was started to be a, a powerful agency uh, for change and an agent of change. And that is part of what Change the Story is all about. And we are the proud funders of Change the Story with our partners uh, with the Vermont Commission and Vermont Works for Women. It's been a really a super um, amalgam of talent and time and brains and, yes, data. Because data is the foundation from which you make change. Because you've got to have the numbers to make your case. And you've got to have the money to make your case. And we have been, thanks to many of you in this room, 
uh, giving donations every year to help fund this work, our work, as giving grants to nonprofits like Capstone with tremendous programs that serve women and girls specifically, as well as our being able to underwrite the costs of Change the Story and keep these 2.5 FTE women, is that right? <laughs> Running, because man, they do the work of about 10 people. So we're very, very proud of that. And um, we have several women here who are either on our council or former council members, if you just raise your hands, because a lot of you have been doing this work. Get your hand up, Susan. <laughs> helping women in Vermont for years and years. But I feel we are making significant change now. A lot has happened, particularly since 2017. And we, um, when we came out, when Change the Story came out with the, with the first set of reports in 2016 and 17, I've got to say we had a good response, but there was a little bit of a ho, oh, oh, ho, hum, you know, more data on women. Well, now that has changed. Policymakers are using our data, thanks to people like you who are clamoring for it and saying we need to make change for women and girls, we collectively are being listened to. And this really would not have happened save for one person here in this room who came to us with this idea of how do we address systemic change in Vermont for women and girls. And without Tiff Bloomley, and I won't make her too embarrassed, um, we wouldn't, this would not have happened. So it's been a monumental effort, and Tiff was smart enough to get some very smart women to work with her, namely Jessica Nordhaus, Allie Johnson Kurtz, Lindsay Lathrop Ryan, and a host of many others. Uh, to, to really drive this work forward, and I couldn't be more proud to introduce Tiff Bloomley. Thank you. All right, take it away. Okay. I will go. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I, I love looking at your faces. I, we're, we're so thrilled that you are here and that you braved icy roads to get here. Um, we're honored that, that you're here. Um, and it's a good sign because it means that there's some energy and some interest. Um, this is the fifth report that we have put together and it started off as a way of updating our data <laughs> and it quickly became a very long project that has resulted in a 50-page report if you count the end notes. So <clears throat> we figured that not everybody would want to dive that deeply, and we put together this executive summary that is in front of you with highlights and our recommendations. Um, the, the full report um, is on our website, and we have some copies here for folks who, who would like it. Um, first, <clears throat> like almost anything, um, this, this was a, a a village effort um, and I'd really like anybody who was a reader of this report who gave us feedback to just stand and be recognized for <clears throat> their input which did but come on come on you people yo <clears throat> come on <clears throat> a lot of you <clears throat> um, I um, <clears throat> We can go to the next slide. Um, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to walk you through the report. That would be boring. Um, what I am going to try to do is just hit on some highlights and um, and underscore a few points that I'd like to leave you with, and then we'll break into our um, panel discussion. As Sue already said, women are a disproportionate share of those who are living on the economic edge. <clears throat> so if you look at this this graph, so. Single male and female householders, <clears throat> um, the rate for men is 3.5%, the rate poverty rate. For women, it's 11.4%. When you introduce minor children to the household, <clears throat> a woman's um, poverty rate um, rises to 36.7%. And then if those children are under five, it, <clears throat> it goes up to 47%. Um, 
the <clears throat> um, next slide, please. The poverty rate is higher for women with disabilities, over twice the rate <clears throat> of women without disabilities. And it's also, next slide, <clears throat> higher for women of color. In fact, for two groups of women, black women and Asian women in Vermont, the poverty rate is higher than the national average. Mm. Women work. <clears throat> they work at a rate that is eight points higher than the national average. Um, <clears throat> and yet, next slide, about four out of 10 of them who work full time cannot make ends meet by the standard that our own joint fiscal office has established in the basic needs budget. <clears throat> Women's earnings um, overall are 16% lower than those of men. And <clears throat> that translates into about $8,000 annually. That statistic, the wage gap, has pretty much been the same for the last decade. And that's true in the United States as well. Progress in reducing the wage gap has stalled. <clears throat> Where women, uh, so why are women's learning, uh, earnings lower? And I'm not gonna go into great depth, but there are a few things I'm just gonna um, go into. Um, women's um, disproportionate share of low-wage jobs. They are 45% of full-time workers, and yet they are 53% <clears throat> Sorry, for, of full-time workers, and they are 53% of low-wage workers. 43% <clears throat> of women today who work full-time work in fields that are traditionally female, which typically pay lower wages. In fact, the statistics about those fields is <clears throat> the same, are roughly the same as they were in 1970. Next slide. <clears throat> Another reason why women's earnings are lower is that they, they're because of time in and out of the labor force. And this is a, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does a survey of people who are working part time. This is national data. Some of, we, some of our data is national and uh, as much of it as we could, could, can have um, uh, Vermont data, we've included in the report. But this is telling. So why do people work uh, part time? Well, women are four times as likely in the survey to cite family and personal obligations <clears throat> for working per as uh, four times uh, more than men. Li <laughs> Sorry, do you know what I meant? Yeah. Okay, more likely good. <laughs> they, they are also seven times more likely to cite childcare problems. The cost of leaving the workforce was astounding to me when I went to the <clears throat> Um, Center for American Priorities, the, there's a calculator, and you plug in, when did you start work, at what age do you um, leave the workforce, for how long, what were you making? And then they calculate what you lose over a period of time. And let's say you started work at 22, you're 35, you have your first child, you leave the workforce for five years until your child goes to kindergarten. The cost of lost wages, potential, boost in earnings and uh, retirement um, uh, totals up to over $400,000. Next slide. <clears throat> the other, uh, this was brought up in the, your, your call outs um, after the Let's Talk Gender um, discussions. Gender norms and biases, social expectations, um, and outright discrimination all play a role in women's lower earnings. <clears throat> PayScale, which is an app that tracks allowances for kids, they did an analysis of the 10,000 families that, are, that subscribe to their app. Guess what they found? That girls make half as much allowance as boys. <clears throat> oh my and yeah, I know, I know. The, the AAUW controlled, it did a study and they controlled for all kinds of variables. Within one year out of college, there was a 7% wage gap. <clears throat> and then finally, you know, this is just an example. Pew Research interviewed Americans about kind of attitudes about 
being in the workplace when you have young children. So Americans, female, male, <clears throat> or on the um, gender spectrum, answered, uh, well, 76% thought men working full time with young children was a way to go. And then, <clears throat> but they only said that 33% of women with young children should be working full time. Those kinds of, I'm really hot. <laughs> Those kinds of um, attitudes are so subtle in many ways, and they, they affect us all in a number of different ways. Next slide, please. Women's economic status is also affected not just by how much they earn, but the debt that they carry. And women carry two-thirds of the student loan debt in this country. Um, also, women's particular experiences of sexual harassment and intimate partner violence have a bearing on earnings that, you know, it, there have been a lot of studies about this, and there's, there's a lot more work to do to really look at that. But women who have been sexually harassed <clears throat> are far more likely to leave their jobs <clears throat> than women who haven't within two years. <clears throat> That's... So what does this mean? You know, if you put this whole picture together, uh, women earn six, have 60, receive 61% of what men do in Social Security benefits. And if you put all of the, the other retirement um, income they may have access to, the median annual income for women over 65 is less than $20,000 in the state of Vermont. <clears throat> so, and there is this cum the cumulative impact of all these different intersections, these, these points in the road add up for women. <clears throat> I, so we need something to shoot for. I mean, I, I don't like to always be the bearer of bad news. So, you know, the in uh, Institute for Women's Policy Research did a study, state by state, and they looked at, well, okay, what if women and men who were of comparable age and work experience and lived in either urban or um, rural settings, level of age, education was comparable, what would be the impact on women in, in each state if they earned, if there was pay equity? And here's what they found, that the poverty rate for working women in Vermont would fall from 4.7% to 1.8%, the second largest decrease in the country. The poverty rate for single working women with children would fall from 15.4% to 4.5%. Again, the second largest decrease nationwide. The poverty rate of children with working mothers would fall 75.6%. That's the largest drop in the country. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, you can go. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> here are some really inspiring young women. <clears throat> and as, as one of the team members said on VPR yesterday in an interview with Jessica Nordhaus um, and Mitch Wortlieb, you know, we're going to be stepping into the workforce soon. This is a real issue for us. And we, <laughs> we expected something a little bit different um, in 2020. So, so this is why we're doing the work. These girls, your daughters, <clears throat> your granddaughters, and our communities, and the health of our state. We ended our report this time not with questions but with a set of recommendations. We felt we'd learned enough over the four and a half years. <clears throat> we had to say something. Uh, and in those recommendations are some really low hanging fruit. I hope the legislators in the room will look at those things. <clears throat> and I'd be happy to talk with you or Carrie Brown would. <clears throat> some will be a real stretch, but we don't have a choice but to stretch. 
We have to address these issues head on. Catalyst, the World Bank, McKinsey, you know, every think tank that you can think of, all of them agree that women are an economic driver. Too many women are underemployed, too many women are working part-time, <clears throat> and this state is too old <clears throat> and hard-pressed for enough labor uh, <clears throat> to let any drop of talent uh, lay fallow. That doesn't really, you know what I meant, though. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> the fastest growing jobs in number in this state are low-wage jobs, cashiers, <clears throat> personal care, attendants, waiters, waitresses. If these jobs are so critical, and they are, <laughs> we have to honor them with full-time wages that can meet basic needs. Otherwise, what are we saying? <clears throat> Otherwise, what are we saying? We are actually training people for many of these jobs. So we're investing money. But we, some, I guess, or we are assuming women will continue to hold those jobs and we can continue to pay them poorly. And that's got to change. I want to leave you this part with three thoughts. <clears throat> One, we can recognize <clears throat> and address the needs of women without negating the needs of men and boys. We have the capacity to hold those dual sets of needs and address them, but address them perhaps somewhat differently because their experiences are different. The wage gap is explained oftentimes, I've had many, many conversations about this, as a product of women's choices. Well, you went into this profession, or you decided to have those children. <clears throat> yes, and <laughs> we all know that we all make decisions within a context. And <clears throat> not all of us are actually, uh, not all of us make the decisions that affect us significantly. How many women are actually supporting themselves because their partner left them? Um, <clears throat> how many women are supporting themselves because their partner died? <clears throat> Finally, I, a lot of the work really requires us to explore our own biases. This is culture change work. There's some legislation that can make a difference, yes. But, for the <clears throat> but even for the will for that kind of legislation, the culture has to change, and we have to get more curious than we normally are about the ways in which our own biases and experiences shape uh, the way we look at the world, who we hire, who we promote, um, who we vote for, <clears throat> et cetera. Moving forward is really about changing our culture, and that begins with each of us. Thanks. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> I want to invite our panelists up um, to the table right now. So, every time I would go to the legislature and I would talk when I was at Vermont Works for Women, I'd talk about, um, uh, <clears throat> I, would, I would take stories, people would say, yeah, where's the data? Now, when we go to legislature and <laughs> we take the data, they say, well, where are the stories? And we know, <laughs> we know that both are important. <clears throat> and stories take us out of the abs I mean out of the abstract and they ground us. And they're they're more real than the numbers are <clears throat> and they're more affecting. And <clears throat> so Capstone has invited three program participants to talk a little bit about the ways in which their experiences relate to the data that um, you read in the report. Um, we also have <clears throat> Rachel Coppola, who is from Vermont Works for Women, um, who uh, runs programs and has her own particular experience 
in working with women <clears throat> um, uh, uh, there. So I guess what I, what I would like to do is just first <clears throat> in, give a really brief overview of each of you. <clears throat> um, Rachel, I'm going to let you talk about your, you know, <clears throat> when you, when I invite you to talk, you can talk a little bit about yourself. But um, <clears throat> so under Mina, <clears throat> um, Bashlagish? Bashlagish. Okay, Bashlagish. Close enough. No, it's not. <laughs> what is it? Nermina Bashlagich. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's oh. <laughs> I will talk with you after this about how to correctly pronounce your last name. I apologize. <clears throat> no problem. She's from Montpelier. She's a sole proprietor of A Cut Above the Rest Pet Grooming in Berrytown. She has an associate's degree from VTC, <clears throat> vet technology, and is a single parent to six-year-old kindergartner Layla. She's a first-generation American <clears throat> whose parents came to this country from Bosnia. And Chelsea. <clears throat> Chelsea Boston is a single mom who lives in Graniteville with her roommate and six-year-old son, Rory. She's currently in her final year at Champlain College and will be graduating this May with a degree in social work. In addition to college classes, Chelsea also works part-time at the Vermont Recovery Network as a program coordinator. She's enrolled in the Reach Up post-secondary education program, <clears throat> and she's worked with a number of capstone programs. <clears throat> and then finally, Chrissy Cushing. <clears throat> she's the assistant chef instructor at Capstone Community Action's Community Kitchen Academy. She graduated from the Kitchen Academy in 2015 and went on to work for CKA part-time while raising three children. She's a survivor of domestic violence and uses her experience and perspective to help students discover their potential in the kitchen and beyond. She lives with her family in Barrie. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, Rachel, why don't you actually just introduce yourself right now since I've done that. Sure. You have the yeah, I'm Rachel Kaupla. I'm the Employment and Career Specialist at Vermont Works for Women, and I'm part of our Step Into Work program that helps women with employment barriers um, get back to work or start their career. Um, and listening um, to the report and to hearing people's shares this morning, um, it, Tiff said that you know matching the data with the stories like I all of these statistics I could tell you a story about a woman that we've served over the past three and a half years that I've worked here um, who exemplifies what's going on so navigating in and out of the workforce because of caring for um, a child or an elderly parent um, negotiating your wage um, at the beginning of your career when you first start a job so that you're not um, you know, suffering from the cumulative effects of the wage gap. Um, so all, all of this is, is exhibited in the people that we serve um, up in Winooski. So I want to just throw this out to the group. Um, what of the stats that you saw in the brief or in, um, you know, um, my talk uh, resonated with you, with your own experience, <clears throat> and, and how so? I guess I'll start. Um, so I know for me, uh, I feel a certain amount of privilege. Um, so while I definitely have had my struggles, I had the benefit of being a white female um, who had the benefit of getting a very excellent education um, in my youth, uh, which then prepared me to go back to school to pursue college and everything like that while I was an adult. And I recognize uh, very heavily <laughs> that not every woman living in poverty has those opportunities and those benefits that I um, kind of gave me a jump start on going back to school and creating a successful life for me and my child. Um, I've also had the benefit of having reliable transportation and a good support network, which is not something that everybody gets, as many of you probably know from your work or even your personal experiences. Um, so while I have certainly had to put in a lot of work to be where I am at and to rise out of poverty. I definitely have had a much easier time of it than a woman of color, a woman with a disability, or even a woman that just didn't receive the level of education that I did when I was a child. Um, so I think that there is still so much work to be done, as you so beautifully put, um, 
and I think that it's important that we all recognize that we have our own privileges that have elevated us um, mm -hmm. above others who mm -hmm. may not have had the same experiences. Mm -hmm. Well. <coughs> I, let me let me let me ask some some more um, specific questions. So, our data shows that 47% of single pam female parent households with children under the age of five have incomes that are below the poverty level. So, <clears throat> the first time you became uh, this is for you, Nermina. <clears throat> um, the first time you became a mom and were enrolled in Reach Up, you were one of those <coughs> parents, and now as a business owner uh, with a child in school, your circumstances have improved. So what changes or opportunities occurred to help you transition into entrepreneurship and financial self-sufficiency? Um, I think that Capstone had a big role in that. Um, back when I was on Reach Up, my daughter was about a year old and it was an unbelievably um, difficult and challenging time for me. And so I was able to take some of the financial empowerment classes with Capstone. Um, they're basically called a money coach and they help you with stuff like building your credit or um, opening up a savings account, you know, protecting yourself from identity theft, all that kind of stuff that I didn't know about that didn't come naturally to me. Um, and so with that, knowledge, I was able to basically start taking the steps that I needed to take to become employed again and work towards some of, you know, the goals that I had for myself. And um, luckily, I was able to find employment. And, um, you know, over a course of five years, I was able to continue to work with Capstone and um, do their um, do their IDA program and stuff like that, which um, helps me to, the IDA program is the Independent Development Account, and it's a program that helps um, people with small businesses to keep them running or get things that you need um, for your business. And one of the, um, sorry, I'm a tiny bit nervous, but um, one of the things that was really important that I learned through Capstone was savings. and. Um, so the it's a match program so if I like save a thousand dollars they'll match it with two and so I can use that towards my business and I've been self-employed it's gonna be going on three years in March and I'm really proud of that and I think that Capstone mm -hmm. really had a huge part in that yeah so definitely a combination of like having reach up and like, you know, all the support from the state and Capstone and all the resources that were literally out there was really what helped me to get my feet back on the ground and, um, you know, to be who I am today. So I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. So um, <clears throat> Chrissy, uh, you shared your experience as um, a survivor of domestic violence. So the research, <clears throat> um, there's been new research really on the financial impact of that um, on um, folks who have experienced um, intimate partner violence. 66% of survivors report that their abusers discourage them for, from participating in educational and job training opportunities. 73% report that their abusers stole paychecks, public benefits, drained their bank accounts, and a startling 83% said their abusers <clears throat> affected their very ability to work. So given your experience in the work that you also do as an advocate um, and support person in the community, um, what do you think about those statistics? And you know, do they resonate with your own experience? Um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> so while I was a participant in the Community Kitchen Academy, um, my partner every day would discourage me from going to class and you know would tell me that he didn't understand why I was doing the program that he you know oh, you don't need to do that you know it's not really going to help you any and it was just very much so discouraging me from taking the class um, and so yeah and every day it was a struggle um, never had any money because he would always spend all our money on whatever he wanted um, 
and would always try to be finding a way to get money. And so very much so, like, it was hard because, you know, not having any money and having kids and worrying about how you're going to buy for your children um, is difficult. Um, I also have um, seen it in the program and in our participants, um, one of which this girl was with an abusive partner. Um, and through me sharing my experiences and how, you know, how much the class has changed my life, I was actually able to help her leave her um, abusive partner as well. Um, so, and she was always telling me how she never had any money either, how her partner would always take everything from her. Um, and so I, I totally agree about the statistics about how it is to live with um, an abusive partner. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Chelsea, <clears throat> as you were a single mom trying to get an education while trying to make ends meet, <clears throat> what was your experience in the workplace? And how, you know, in terms of balancing all the different responsibilities that you had, did you, did you encounter any of the challenges that you know, we describe in the report? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so previously to going back to school, I was stuck in service jobs, um, predominantly fast food work, um, because it was the only thing that could really match my hours. Um, like Chrissy, I was in a domestic abuse situation with my child's father um, until he was one. Uh, and when I left my child's father, I actually moved back to Vermont. Um, so. Capstone was actually the organization that pointed me in the direction of VSAC, which unfortunately I did not qualify for for my <laughs> first year of college. Um, but when I was able to qualify for that after I had reached Vermont citizenship, it was just so helpful. Um, and in the in-between, things were definitely very rough. Um, I think that anybody starting over anywhere, uh, that's a tough situation, but especially when you are kind of being catapulted from having even though you know support from a domestic violence situation is not as awesome as a more healthy situation there's still a level of support there and so cutting off that support of the partner and then moving to a place where um, you're not very familiar uh, is definitely challenging and capstone was really very integral in my ability to make it work i mean i can honestly say I still access the food pantry at Capstone because right now with my college classes and being a single parent, I can't take on extra work hours when things get tough. Um, so I'm kind of stuck at part time and I'm lucky that I work a job that is very flexible in the hours. Um, but as things are right now, if I took on any more workload, there would have to be some sort of give. Either my homework wouldn't be getting done um, or my child wouldn't be seeing me or, you know, um, so having Capstone there as a level of support to help me, like she said, to help me uh, figure out the finances of a dilapidated romantic relationship, which is tricky, um, to provide food when food was scarce, um, and to just generally be people that I could talk to when I really needed some support, it's just been amazing. Um, Capstone is an incredible organization with so many different ways to support people. Um, and I'm actually currently in the same savings program that you were talking about, um, working on saving for a home. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully after graduation, I will go full time at my job and the IDA will help me buy a home and stability will finally be achieved. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So another program provider <clears throat> in the state um, uh, is Vermont Works for Women, who works with uh, women across um, a lot of different backgrounds. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about what res resonated for you? Sure. I'm, I want to take a minute to sort of jump on a couple um, themes that have come up in the last couple of minutes. Um, so one of, one of the struggles that I see a lot of the women that I serve um, struggle with is um, the lack of flexibility around employment and like really being limited in the jobs that they're able to take because of um, being single parents and having to do drop off and pick up, um, being able, uh, needing the flexibility to stay home with a sick kid um, and those sorts of things. And so that's something that um, 
myself and my organization really try to work with coaching women on is how, how to navigate those conversations with employers and how to advocate for themselves so that they are able to get that flexibility that's really essential in, in, their, um, in their efforts to get back to work. Um, also, um, in terms of domestic violence, um, that is certainly something that we um, work with women on who have had to repeatedly leave jobs because of an abuser, um, who have had who have relocated to this area um, and have very few work references from their um, previous um, where, where they lived previously. Um, abusers who have gone to their workplaces and um, you know made threats and then they lose that job, and so that is certainly. Um, that's sort of a not very well known um, thing that happens in our communities um, that is really detrimental to women's economic stability. Um, I also want to touch on something um, that you were saying about that it, you've been working with the Capstone for five years and, and the, the importance of these ongoing supports, that it's not sort of a quick fix, um, you know, let's do a three month program and you're good to go. It's ongoing supports um, that are essential to helping people, um, you know, build um, themselves out of poverty um, and and um, you were saying, Chelsea, that the, you know, the supports that you got of having an education, um, you know, the, you know, my, my favorite stories that I have working with participants are um, just the really little things that I encourage women to do, um, like applying for a job if they're not, if, even if they don't meet all the qualifications. Um, you know, so someone, you know, didn't have a bachelor's degree, there was this job that sounded perfect for her, and she's like, well, I can't apply. Yes, you can apply, you know, go for it. And then I can't do that because it's 40 hours a week, and I need to work 35 because I have a special needs child who requires these appointments once a week and so I can't do that job well yes you can do that job ask them if they would be willing to take you for 35 hours a week and you know by golly they were <laughs> and so um, the the little supports that we can offer on an ongoing basis really do make a big difference um, in in helping women achieve this economic independence um, so I think that's really the sort of um, longevity of the support is really um, important to remember yeah thank you I want to make sure that <coughs> we have um, time for, uh, huh? <coughs> All right. Well, okay. All right. <coughs> um, so, I, you know, I, well, I'd like to open it up because I'm sure you have questions um, for the panel. Is that okay, Allie? You're kind of the running, running this show, so, okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> um, questions for the audience. Um, about experiences, um, uh, the, our panelists, or about the data that appears in the, you know, executive summary that you have, or that I mentioned here. Come on. I've got a question. Okay. Yes. I Um, so, I'll start out by explaining what the Community Kitchen Academy um, is. It's a work readiness program that Capstone offers. It helps people to gain the necessary skills to get a job in the culinary industry. Um, we train them on how to do simple things like, you know, make even just like the sauces and how to make a stock and how to just do all the first basic simple things that you need to know to cook. Um, and we also do job readiness and we also get them a resume and we help them with interviewing skills. Um, they also take some classes at CVABE to help them with computer skills. Um, it, and then they take their manager serve safe exam um, if they don't pass that, we give them their food handlers um, test. So we truly try to make sure they leave our program with having a serve safe certificate. Um, they also take their Vermont liquor license. 
Um, and if they pass their manager serve safe and the Vermont liquor license and do all the papers and all the tests that we require of them, they actually graduate the course with nine college credits for CCV. Um, when I graduated, it, I actually managed to get the nine college credits for CCV, which is great. Um, I, before Capstone stepped into my life, I don't think that I would have ever have managed to get any college credits. Um, Capstone just does a really amazing work. Um, they have helped me be able to, you know, keep a job for the last three and a half years. Um, before that, I was only keeping a job maybe three months at a time. Um, and part of that is they have given me so much confidence in myself. And the fact that I am good enough to have a job and that I did deserve better than what I had before. Um, and a year and a half after taking the job at Capstone, I actually wound up leaving my abusive ex. And I now am able to have a car loan that I would never have thought before that I could have actually have gotten because of the situation that I was in before. Um, they just help out with so much. I have so many of my graduates come to me and tell me that they don't know where they would be without the program. Um, and it's just nice to be able to be a part of what Capstone um, has to offer and be an alumni of one of their programs. Oh, um, our job placement, right? <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> nicely done. <laughs> our job placement rate, right? Um, after they get out of the program is first off, when they get out of the program, we have a over a ninety percent job placement rate. Um, <laughs> Our retention, which is after three months of keeping the job, is in the 80s percent of our graduates keep the job for at least three months. So it is amazing and it's great. And I have to say this, that our class right now, our class right now, six out of eight of our students are actually women, which is amazing. <laughs> and most of our classes, most of our classes are mostly women, which is amazing because that's just great. Getting women ready to work is amazing. <laughs> well, I'd be interested in, in your perspectives on, you, you kind of have a, a captive audience here. And there, there are a lot of people who, uh, not just policymakers, but people who run organizations um, that, like VZAC, um, uh, who are in the audience. And I'm just wondering, what, what would make it the biggest difference for, um, uh, what would have made, you know, a, a big difference for you? What, what would you, I, I'm <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I am a little tired. So the, I guess my, my question is, where do you think there's leverage? What would you want to say, do this, and it will make the kind of change that Capstone was able to make for, for each of you? So I think the big one, in my opinion, both personally and professionally, um, so prior to my position at the Vermont Recovery Network, I worked at the Good Samaritan Haven here in Barrie for um, about three years. And uh, for me, it's transportation. Um, so I am lucky that I have had a car so I could drive to my classes in Montpelier mm -hmm. at CCV. Um, I'm lucky that I have a car and can drive to Burlington to my classes at Champlain College, which has a single parents program. Um, and the single parents program there pays your tuition in full if you have at least 50% custody and are meeting certain income levels. Um, but if I didn't have transportation, I wouldn't have been able to take advantage of those opportunities that are so important for not only the advancement of education, but by extension, the advancement of employment. Um, so I definitely think expanding our transportation system would be beneficial um, to so many people in our state. I think that right now the transportation systems we have in place are limited in their hours. Um, and I think that 
a lot of people who are in these more low-income positions need transportation that's a little bit more accessible, um, especially in rural areas, as well as um, with more accessible times. Because um, I think one thing that we've kind of explored here is that so many of these positions that people are in when they're low income are more evening hours, weekend hours, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that would be really, cr really, really critical. Yeah. <coughs> I think, I think that it's really um, important to continue to fund places like Capstone. Um, as I was talking about the um, financial empowerment classes that I was um, taking, I, was, I think about how that kind of knowledge doesn't come naturally to me. And so I would love to see more people being able to take advantage of the courses that they have to offer. And so I think with more funding, they would be able to have more financial coaches and stuff because those are really, you know, the building blocks to helping people um, budget and keep employment and really know how to do that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel, you want to say something? <clears throat> Um, I would I would second both of those for sure. Transportation and, and funding for nonprofits are the nonprofits that we have around Vermont who are doing this work are amazing. Um, and and many of us like Capstone and Vermont Works for Women have been around a long time doing this work. Um, I would I would also add to that more more funding for childcare, um, paying our childcare workers better. Um, and, and this legislative season, I'm very excited about um, the paid family leave, um, as well as raising the minimum wage. Um, those are two pieces of legislation. Those are two pieces of legislation that could really make a huge difference for particularly our, our women living in poverty in the state. Um, I would also, um, you know, two additional, you know, pleas would be um, for employers to be more aware of the um, barriers that um, women and single parents have to entering the workforce and, and being more open and um, aware of flexible scheduling um, because that, that just, it really is a huge barrier to the women I'm working with and helping them find employment. Um, and then um, the second thing is to um, having our funders um, tie their funding to training programs that aren't necessarily um, come, don't necessarily come with a credential, but still offer um, you know, critical support um, to to people living in poverty. Um, so even though it, the, it might not have a serve safe um, certification, um, there is great work done being around the state that isn't tied to a credential. And so I'd love to see more funding for programs um, like that. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. and, and then they're home with their kids, and then they go back to work, and they've lost that increase in wage, they lost that job in many cases, they lost that retirement. Um, I just want to speak, like, biologically, because I'm the one, you know, like, I couldn't be working a full-time job right now. I could way too many pregnant women come in. It's not realistic. And um, the other thing is, like, I live here in the Black Rock Center all the time. It's annoying for me to have to, but I don't, I don't Oh yeah, oh it totally makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, and 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 for most of the women in in the state who have children, it's really not an, an option. I mean, 70% as Let's Grow Kids has said, 70% of um, children uh, five and under have all available parents in the workforce. And we, I, I think that it, practically speaking, um, it, it, it is a huge financial 
uh, takes a huge financial toll for a parent to leave the workforce. Um, that said, um, other countries do a lot of different things. Um, and there are many, many examples of um, ways in which we can enable both, uh, both parent, I mean, parents um, uh, of families to actually take leave. Um, and so paid leave or leave that is um, uh, government sponsored. I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I don't, um, well, I'm not a policy expert in that field, but there's so much that has been written about all the options that exist um, and the examples of people who are doing things differently. Yeah. I, I'd like to add just a couple of things about right. that. So um, certainly uh, neg helping women navigate exiting the workforce and then coming back is something that we do a lot of. And so um, coaching women, women on how to do that in a way that they can sort of keep their toes in, you know, of like doing a little bit of volunteer work, doing like, a, you know, even minimal part-time work while they're staying home to keep their, you know, skills fresh, their resume fresh, so when they go to apply to job in one year, two years, three years, or however long, that they have recent experience um, and are still, you know, involved in the community, involved in the issues. Um, but then I also think there's some awareness that needs to be built among employers around, okay, there's this person who has exited the workforce and it's coming back, like let's let's respect that gap in employment. Let's understand that they were doing something essential for themselves and their families, and now they're back and they're ready to go. And they didn't become less smart or less capable in the years that they were away. And so I think there's a shift and an awareness that needs to be built there. And if there's a, a job that opens up um, while somebody is on maternity leave, um, you don't just automatically write them off as not interested. Um, and several employers have, have um, talked about the mistakes they've made in making that assumption um, and not having the conversation when, when, when a job did come up that might um, very well um, be filled by somebody who's on leave. I, I, think, um, I think we're probably... So what we're gonna do now is really open this up <clears throat> to conversation. We have about 10 or so more minutes um, you can feel free to ask any more questions to our panelists or just share inspirations from the day. Before doing that, I do want to see, do the, any of the panelists want to make sort of their final comment of anything? Is there anything that you didn't get to share that you might have wanted to? And you have a mic there that we think is going to work. I, I guess I want to say a little bit about the topic we were just talking about with that you brought up about you know children and wanting to be with them. I went back to school when my child was one. Um, and I can honestly say, uh, between classes, I worked full time for two years during that time period, homework. Um, I can honestly say that every single semester, I debate with myself about whether it's worth it to go back to school right now. Um, because kids, and I might tear up a little bit, because kids, when they're that young, they don't understand, right, that you have to write this paper or you fail. They don't understand that I'm going to school so that we can have a better life, right? And especially being somebody who's pursuing a degree in social work and child development being a huge chunk of that, you are going to school and being taught these are the most formative years at the same time as you're struggling through them and not seeing your kid as much as you would like to. And I actually personally ended up taking a step back from full-time employment because I realized I was barely seeing my child. Um, and it really didn't sit well with me. Um, but it's, it's definitely a struggle to make that choice. And I think that any single parent um, especially struggles to make that choice. Is this what's best for my kids? What do I do with the fact that I'm gone so much during those formative years? So I, I definitely cannot stress enough that paid leave is so important. Um, even a lot of companies or organizations in America that have leave, it's not paid, which is a huge problem. Um, I know personally at four weeks old, I was back to work. Um, I did not even take six um, because I was the only person working in our situation and it had to be done. Um, so while that biological need is definitely there and it doesn't get any less there, like every year I go back to school, it's there a little more almost. Um, it's, it's definitely heartbreaking and it's why these changes are so important 
um, and why we really need to be doing the work that we're doing to make them. Yeah. Um, so when I first got the job at Capstone, I found out a month later that I was actually pregnant with my third child while I was working at Capstone. And I have to say, Capstone is an amazing organization. I was able to have taken three months off to be able to care for my child after I gave birth. And then they were so amazing because my boss knew that I was breastfeeding. And my boss had said to me, you know, whenever you have to go pump, don't worry about it, you know, just go pump. And so Capstone is just amazing with the fact of that they do give the opportunity for you to take three months off. And I could have taken longer than three months off if I had wanted to. Um, but for my family, you know, I, had, I only had so many paid, so much paid time off that I could take and so many hours that I could take. And, you know, I was the sole provider for my family at that point in time. So after three months, I had to go back into work. But it was amazing knowing that any time that I had to leave to go pump, that I could. And a Capstone is just very supportive of families and women who have children and want to still provide for their children. You know, with even just the simple thing of knowing that any time I needed to do the simple act of pumping so I could feed my son, it was there. Um, and after, so all the support that I've received from Capstone, um, I work on the weekends during the summer. I work in the, at the Waterbury Flea Market. They have a little snack shack there, and I actually am managing the little snack shack that they have there. I managed it all last summer, and I will be able to manage it again this summer. And it's just amazing because I have went from, you know, not really making ends meet now to being able to, you know, fully provide for my family and not worry about how am I going to pay for this and this while this right now, this bill is past due, so I'll pay this one and then I'll wait to pay this one. I don't have to worry about situations like that anymore. And it's just nice to know that, you know, Capstone has been a very big provider of that and they've given me so much confidence in everything that I am able to do. So it's just amazing. Capstone is absolutely amazing pro program. And you are amazing, by the way. Um, Nermina, I was, I'm Colin, by the way, I was connecting to your story when you mentioned uh, having a little kid and just trying to get through the day and, and probably not thinking much about the future or what you want your life to look like. And I'm wondering if that has changed for you now and if you have you know, something you want to do in the future or something that you're hopeful about. Is that us? Yeah, it was. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> something you want to do in the future or something that you're hopeful about for any of you? I think that I would like to continue doing dog grooming. Um, life is certainly easier now since I am self-employed and I am able to stay home if my kid is sick or if I don't have um, child care. And I wish that other women were able to do that. And so I'm glad that we're all here and I appreciate everyone. Um, for being here. I just think it's so important, all the topics that we've been talking about. Um, I think, like I said, I definitely see myself continuing to do dog grooming five years from now. I'd like to get a larger space at some point, maybe with another groomer um, and a bather. And, um, you know, I would really love to at some point be a homeowner. And I know that when I'm ready to take those steps that Capstone will continue to support me in a non-judgmental um, type of environment. And so that's one thing that I've always appreciated about them. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna keep like, you know, saving and working and um, working towards more goals. And um, I think Capstone will definitely play a big part in that. And so that's where I see myself in five years or so.
I just want to say, as a director of Capstone, thank you for mentioning Capstone so often, but really, let's recognize it as those super women up there who are changing the story for their lives. So my name is Andy Dora Crane. I work with Planned Parenthood here in the Barry community, and it's lovely to have this be my first experience with not only exploring concepts laid out by Vermont Women's Fund, Vermont Works for Women, and I've been thinking a lot about this name of this event, which is Change the Story, and if you're going to change the story, you need to constantly be looking several steps ahead at what you really want this to look like. And I happened to be somebody of great privilege that had a lot of financial education in my life and was the byproduct of a woman who's a second wave feminist and made the scary decision to take two and a half years off of my career, which is a healthcare provider's questionable decision because you're considered stale at two plus and can you go back in? I don't know where the hole is that all that information leaks out of, but it's a reality. <laughs> so. You know, I took advantage of capstone programs during that time, um, and it was extremely helpful. One of the things I would challenge all of us as we look ahead, and as we are ch attempting to change this story, is if I'm a non-female identified person, or if I'm a non-woman identified person, where are my organizations that are helping me with this? This is fantastic for a big majority of people but we do have people that don't identify as such who have disproportionately high rates of domestic violence and potentially other social determinants that put them um, not in a privileged place to be able to close this wage gap. And as we see youth that are more and more embracing of these non-binary identity states or just a gender identity spectrum, how are we partnering with those folks and how can we all strive together to really what ends up being reducing a privilege of uh, male identity to be at the top. So, to name that in reference to changing the story. Well, indeed, I mean, your, your call in part is for data, right? Uh, which, I mean, the census, you've got two choices um, when you're answering those questions. And so, while there are some national organizations that have produced data that we've included in our report um, on, <clears throat> on members of the LGBTQIA community, there's not enough um, at all. That, and so that's work for somebody else out there. Um, and, and somebody's gotta fund it. Um, I am, I, I, don't, I don't have my watch on and I just wanna know <laughs> No, well, what about Carrie? We've got five minutes left. Then. All right. Are there other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Jen Wood with Green Mountain Transit, and um, I work with rural areas, so I appreciated the comments about transportation. But I have to brag for a moment that my main claim to fame is that the Honorable Tiff was the efficient at my wedding. So, <laughs> anyway, um, my question is: There's many things that um, you know that have been talked about that we can do, but I'm curious from each of the women up there if you could give us one, you know, call to action when we leave here today. What would be, you know, the one prominent thing that we could do to kind of support all these issues that we care about? So. I mean, I think one thing that's really important is keeping the conversation going. Um, I don't know how many of you were at the SOAR event that Capstone put on uh, earlier this year. Um, but that was another great forum for having discussions like these and kind of assessing the needs in our communities and also generating some creative solutions. Um, I think that unfortunately, uh, depending on the level of stigma surrounding certain topics, we aren't having enough conversations about it. Um, I don't know if that's because of complacency or just the feeling that what good can we possibly do? Um, but I think that together we are so much stronger and together we do have so many creative solutions that we could discuss and possibly implement. Um, and I think we're really benefiting from living in a place that has, as a state, that really big drive towards social, economic, you know, all these different types of justices that are so important. Um, so I think that Capstone is doing a fantastic job of keeping that conversation going. 
um, and giving people a forum to have those discussions and to generate those solutions. I think you covered it, thank you. <laughs> um, I would say, yes, continue, like take what you've heard today and share it with the people that you know. Um, and then also write to your legislators about these two important pieces of legislation that are coming up this year because they, they really ma will make a big difference. One final question. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Tom Stevens, I'm, and I'm the chair of the um, General Housing and Military Affairs Committee, which you might ask, well, what does that have to do with paid family leave or minimum wage? But th th these bills get written in our committee. And I'm going to challenge you to go one step further, to not write to your legislators, but to call them. Um, back when I first got involved politically in Vermont, Howard Dean was running for president, and one of the things that stood in my mind was, and he may have been quoting someone else, I don't really know, but he said, you know what, if you get out and vote, you get a C in civics. And that's really powerful, because we keep saying you have to vote, you have the right to vote, and you should, you need to vote, and you get a C. But on these two issues in particular, I've been working on these issues in different ways for the last 12 years. First with paid sick days, now with paid family leave. And there's a bill that's now sitting in the House. Um, Jill Krowinski left, my boss left, so I can be a little bit more open here. Um, <laughs> and the bill that came over from the Senate and is sitting in the House right now, we're gonna decide how we're gonna handle it. And it's not as good a bill as it was when it left the House, but it's a bill that the Senate, it's far more generous than the Senate has ever passed before in their existence. There's many of us who, who don't believe that it's strong enough, but even the bill that we pass, if we pass it as strong as what we passed out of committee, it's still nowhere near as strong as Lithuania's or Bulgaria's. So we're talking about you know, bills that are beginnings in, in Vermont and in the United States. So what I'm asking you to do is to get a little bit more activated. There's so much more power in this room than just talking about these issues. You know, hearing about people's experiences in the face of the difficulties that we face and that women face and women of poverty face in this state every single day. There are people in the state house, I mean, like this is the broad part, this is the base of the pyramid here. You know, by the time you get to the governor, who's the tip of the pyramid, it gets harder and harder and harder to pass the bill that we think is fair, and is equitable, and that gets to the points of what we're talking, what we spent this morning talking about, which is trying to, if not eradicating poverty for a great number of people in the state, then at least ameliorating it and making life a little bit easier by having more compassion in the policies that we pass in order to make their lives easier. You shouldn't have to choose whether you're going back to work in four weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks or whatever it is. It shouldn't be that difficult, but it is. So. Right now, I've been told that you know the bill that's in the House is the bill that we're going to start with. Um, the Senate isn't very keen on negotiating it de um, to be more generous than it is. So maybe you need to call me, or maybe you need to call your senators and tell them that this is an issue. Somehow, over time, minimum wage and paid family leave, which are women dominant issues. That's what we heard today, that this affects women at home and in the workplace far more than it does men. And somehow it gets degendered in order to get it passed because men have to feel it's okay to vote for it. And I'm just, you know, I'm sorry, I just got back from vacation, so I'm a little freer with perhaps what I might be saying in January. I might be a little bit more politic about it, but. You have the power, and the power is in your voices, to tell the story and to make the people who are making the decisions believe you when you say it's going to make a difference. Because by the time it gets to the top, and it gets degendered, and it gets into, into numbers, then people 
start making decisions that are weaker and less sure of themselves and less compassionate. So call us, leave messages for us, and really don't stop until we pass a bill that gets these policies put forward in the state of Vermont. It's paid family, well, paid family leave, I believe, is H-107. And minimum wage is a Senate bill, I think it's S-54. But they're, they're at the end of their legislative, the, the negotiations will start on January 7th about what we're going to put forward and see if the governor will veto them. And if he does, then we have to have the votes to override the veto. And then the work begins again and again and again to make the bill even better as time goes on. Does Thank you. Have the sergeant at arms number? When you're in no, school? I don't have the sergeant at arms number. <laughs> eight two eight. <laughs> I should know. You should know it's six thousand. Anyway, all of those phone calls will be really helpful. I think it's that's a great closer, Tom. I think it's time for your final words and Carrie's. Yeah. And I want to actually let's just give a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was um, really fantastic. I wish we had a lot more time to take you, your questions and hear from our panelists. Um, can we just thank the panelists one more time? And all of you for your participation. In that. And, and I want to give a special thanks to Capstone uh, for partnering with Change the Story on this. Uh, we've heard so much about their amazing programs and their work to make this event possible, as well as to put into action some of the work that we know needs to be done. So thank you to Capstone. And to the partner organizations of Change the Story, Vermont Commission on Women. You can clap for me if you want. And, <laughs> and uh, Vermont Works for Women and the Vermont Women's Fund. Just need to thank all of the partners. And uh, so just as a follow-up to the last little bit of our discussion, uh, part of what I've been tasked with here is a little bit of a call to action for you all. And we have heard a lot about what can we do, what can be done. But I want to appeal to uh, a, a few certain groups in here. So we have legislators, policymakers, decision makers at all levels. And I want you to think about, after you've read this report, Think about the data that you use in your work, the data that you need in your work, and to use what we've given to you, but also to ask for a lot more. So when you're thinking about how your programs will run, about how you're gonna be spending state money, think about who's benefiting from that, who do we wanna benefit from that, and ask questions about gender, but also about race, about age, about disability, and make sure that the people that you want to be serving are actually the ones that you are. And so that's my plea to those of you with that kind of a power. Um, many of you are employers or you have some responsibility in workplaces. If workplaces can think about ways to keep women at work, and we've heard a lot about that today, also to keep parents at work in general, because a big part of why the women are having a hard time staying at work or putting in the time that they may want to is because they are unduly burdened with family responsibilities. It is way out of proportion. The amount of time that women spend taking care of family, taking care of home, all of these things outside of their paying work compared to men. And so there are things that workplaces can do to try to even that out a little bit. Paid family leave is one we've heard a lot about paid family leave that's available to both parents, that is not just available to both parents, but that is structured in a way that allows parents to take it, that allows and encourages fathers to take just as much parental leave as mothers, could go a long way to kind of redistributing that burden a little bit, so that it may still be difficult to be a parent and to hold down a full-time job, but it shouldn't be more difficult to be a mother than it is to be a father. 
And then finally, to everybody else in this room, think about your own biases. Think about what it, the assumptions that we have. Think about the messages that we're passing on to the young people that we know. And, and think about consciously countering some of those. So talking to the young women that you know about the various kinds of options that they may have, educationally, career-wise, just choices that they make in their own families, as well as to the young men that you know, so that we can, we are already, I see this all the time, seeing a great shift in young people's ideas about who's supposed to take care of the family and who's supposed to do the work, and in spite of some of the discouraging statistics that we see in the report, those attitudes are slowly changing. And so we all can do our part to help continue in that direction. So it's just a few little things for you to do. Not much, not much. Uh, the report gives you more specific recommendations. I thank you all for coming, and I look forward to uh, not having to issue reports like this again in the future. Yeah.